If you want, I'll sell you a life story about a man who's at loggerheads with his past all the time. Surely there has never been a more appropriate first line on an album than that one, taken from Son of a Gun. Being as it is about a man so haunted by his history that he feels trapped within it, it reads like an ironic prophecy of what would become of the band's leader and chief songwriter, Lee Mavers. Noel Gallagher once told The Quietus, when I see him, I say, hey Lee, when are you gonna release your second album? And he says, yeah, 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 I'll do it when I finish the first one. Once aptly described by Matthew Macefield, the Lars biographer, as being the J.D. Salinger of rock, Lee Mavers disappeared from the public eye amid stories like the one Noel Gallagher tells of obsessive perfectionism. He disowned the Lars' debut album upon its release, apparently utterly disappointed with its sound, and has allegedly spent the best part of the last three decades seeking to perfect it. As soon as the album came out and Mavers withdrew himself from promoting it, that's essentially when the wind was sucked from the sails of both the band and the record, both metaphorically and literally in terms of record sales. And for the album, that's the saddest thing of all. Because J.D. Salinger, he disappeared from view after writing a novel, The Catcher in the Rye. But in Lee Mavers' case, his reputation rests almost entirely on one irrefutably classic song. But there's so much more to the Lars than just There She Goes. There's so much more to this book than just that one chapter. The Lars' eponymous debut album boasts a timelessness and a songwriting quality that makes it one of the greatest albums and especially one of the greatest debut albums that's ever been made. Welcome to 2020 Sound, the channel where we take a look back at underrated classics from indie and alternative rock history. If that sounds like something you'd want to watch more videos about, do please give us a subscribe. For all intents and purposes, the Lars album is a proto-Britpop album, at least on the surface. It seems to embody the same sort of reverence for the 60s British canon of the Beatles, the Stones, the Kinks and the Who, as the bands that followed in their footsteps four or five years later did. And there's no doubt the band would have thrived in that scene, as John Power, the Lars bassist, did with Cast, the band that he formed after leaving the Lars. In fact, he named the band after the last word of the last song on the Lars album, Looking Glass. But one of the biggest criticisms levied at the Britpop groups is that they were merely paying homage to the 60s influences that inspired them. But with the Lars, I don't think that was the case. There's a sense that the music on their album is as much inspired by the artists that influenced those 60s groups as the 60s groups themselves. We're talking classic rock and roll, rockabilly, folk, skiffle, rhythm and blues, predominantly, but not exclusively, American influences. Some of these songs you can more imagine being performed by the Quarrymen, John Lennon's pre-Beatles outfit, than the Beatles themselves. A song like Liberty Ship is pure Lonnie Donegan. <laughs> Doldrum and IOU feel like they could be Elvis Presley classics. You ain't nothing but a hand dog. On the street, the Failure is like Bo Diddley filtered through a sex pistol snarl. You can't judge honey by looking at the beat. No, you can't. like Chuck Berry with a slightly faster bounce. No particular place to go. I do not ask for any These songs fizz with a raw energy siphoned straight from the roots of rock and roll. And this approach completely differentiated the Lars from their peers. The Lars were formed by Mike Badger in 1983 with Lee Mavers joining the band the following year. They then signed to Go Discs in 1987 and released their debut single Way Out that same year. This was one year after the NME released their infamous C86 compilation tape, a snapshot of the British indie scene at that time. I always remember reading about ex-members of the band Orange Juice being outraged by the music on this cassette. Their criticism was that Orange Juice appeared to be a big influence on the groups on this cassette, with their modus operandi of trying to combine the Velvet Underground with Chic to create a sort of shambolic kind of groove. But they felt that the C86ers had taken their sound and whitewashed it, 
ignoring the influence of soul and disco. Conversely, although the Lars are far from a disco band, much of their music feels built directly on raw R&B foundations. It's not all filtered through white 60s rock and pop. They may not have been reinventing the wheel, but they were certainly giving it a damn good spin as well as any of their influences did. And this element to their sound gave them a distinctiveness that set them apart from any of their contemporaries in the 1980s, or any of the Britpop bands that they influenced in the mid-90s, or any of the bands in the Madchester and Shoegaze scenes that were their contemporaries when the album came out in 1990. Of course, some of the band's best songs are touched by those 60s sounds, but again, the influences kind of sound more American to me than they do British, with the exception perhaps of I Can't Sleep, which has a stabbing rhythm very reminiscent of The Who. One of the big 60s influences that I hear, and this may all just be in my head, because I've never heard Lee Mavers make any reference to them, and I'm very much aware of the almost mythical influence that this band has over musicians in Liverpool. But one of the big 60s influences that sounds like it's in the Lars DNA is Arthur Lee's love. There's a saying that in Liverpool, you're never more than 200 yards away from a copy of Forever Changes by Love. And there's something in the stately, psychedelic grandeur of Looking Glass that really reminds me of that album. And the song Timeless Melody, there's something in the rhythm of that song that really calls to my mind Arthur Lee's band. And Love's Los Angeles contemporaries, The Birds, cast a humongous shadow over the most famous song on this album. There is something utterly magical about There She Goes. I think there are certain songs which sound almost elemental, like no one's actually written them, like it's taken a particular band or songwriter to come along and just pluck them out of the ether. That's very much the case with There She Goes. It sounds to me like it's just always existed. There's very few songs I feel that way about, but a lot of the ones that I do happen to be written by Bob Dylan. And I think that There She Goes simply wouldn't exist had the birds not covered Dylan's Mr. Tambourine Man. Hey, Mr. Tambourine Man to me, it sounds like Lee Mavers has taken Mr. Tambourine Man, which is kind of like the cornerstone of the birds' sound, and he's absolutely perfected it. He's written the greatest bird song that the birds never wrote. As undeniably brilliant as There She Goes is, my favourite Lars song is Way Out. And that's probably because it also has beautiful melodies, but it's just so underplayed. Give me one. For all the talk about spotting inspirations and influences, this wonderfully hopeful song sounds like it could have been written at any point in the last 60 odd years, but somehow it still manages to feel very uniquely them. And that's the quality that keeps this album sounding so timeless. Most of these songs sound like they could have come out at any point since the birth of rock and roll. And as much as Lee Mavers may hate it, I actually think Steve Lillywhite did a pretty good job of producing this album. There's very little in the way that the music sounds that ties it to any particular trends or any particular times in history. You don't hear it and go, oh yeah, that's a 1990 sounding album. It still mostly just sounds like a bunch of lads playing songs in a room. And any effects that are there, used very subtly and only to enhance the songs, like the haunting keys, or at least I think they're keys, that appear at the end of Liberty Ship, or the layers and layers of vocals and guitars that get piled on at the end of Looking Glass. The 
the making of this album was infamously torturous. Way Out and There She Goes were released as singles in 1987 and 1988, but are different versions to the ones that appear on the album. When it came time to record the album, they attempted to record it five times over the space of two years with four different producers. The first being John Porter, who'd worked with The Smiths. Then there was Mike Hedges, who'd been working with The Cure and Susie and the Banshees. John Leckie, who went on to work with The Stone Roses and Radiohead, but prior to that had been working with John Lennon, XTC and Pink Floyd. And eventually Steve Lillywhite, who's worked with everyone from The Psychedelic Furs to U2 to The Rolling Stones. Mavers wasn't satisfied with any of the recordings, as he continued to chase the sound in his head. This ultimately led to Go Discs asking Steve Lillywhite to take the recordings that he had and to piece together the album as we know it today. There's an infamous quote from Mavers, which has since been thought to be an exaggeration, but so it goes, he allegedly dismissed one vintage mixing desk as not having the right sound because it didn't have original 60s dust on it. Whether it's true or not, I think Mavers was, like so many of us, Enthralled with nostalgia? I think he was chasing memories rather than sounds. That's the incredible power of music. We don't just hear songs. They conjure images in our head, the memories of where we were at certain times when we heard those songs. The nightclubs, the gig venues, the people we were with, the Christmas day mornings, the, the living room time spent with headphones on as a kid. The music that Lee Mavers grew up listening to, the music that would have soundtracked those moments. I think even if he'd managed to capture an authentic 50s or 60s sound for the Lars, I still don't think that would have been enough for him. Because I think ultimately he was chasing a feeling Perhaps the feeling that he sings about on the last song, Feeling. And that feeling is defined by the moments that surround the music, not the sound. The irony being that for so many of his fans, this album has provided the soundtrack to those very moments in their lives. It could never be that for Mavers, because he never grew up with this album. But for those of us that did, it's timeless melodies, and I apologise profusely for that pun, but it's true. It's timeless melodies capture that magic like few albums can. For Mavers, the Lars album may hang around his neck like an albatross, but for the fans, it's nothing less than a gold medal. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know what you think about the Lars album. Do you think it sounds better than Lee Mavers does? Please let me know in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, then do please give us a like and share it with anyone who you think may enjoy this video as well. And if you'd be interested in watching further videos all about classic underrated albums from indie and alternative rock history, then do please subscribe.